Think about this. A lobotomy is a form of neurosurgical treatment for psychiatric disorders that involves severing the connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex. The treatment was used mostly as a cure for depression, OCT, and schizophrenia. We now know more about these conditions, and as an example, research is starting to show that depression may actually have as much to do or more with your environment than your brain. Nonetheless, it's most certainly not cured by carving up your frontal lobe. So why is it that we feel that people with gender dysphoria, which is also a psychiatric condition, will be cured by messing with hormones or worse, amputating body parts? Day 11 of girlhood, and I figured it was about time that we talk about hormones, something we've all got. I just have a few extra on board. I think there's enough evidence here that I can prove to you that the current model of gender-affirming treatment is a humanitarian failure. By comparing it to the Vogue 1940s and 50s lobotomy, comparing some of the data, and taking a look at some of the recent developments in gender dysphoria treatment. If you think these conversations are as fun as I do, hit those like and subscribe buttons. My name is Chris, and this is The Think Report. It seems to me that a comparison between the lobotomy and our current treatment of gender dysphoria draws a fair amount of similarities. The most obvious one being that it's a physical treatment for a psychological condition. There are certainly success stories of people who've had gender-affirming surgeries 15 to 25 years ago and are still very happy with their decision. You can read them in the comments of my videos. But for every success story, there seem to be many, if not more, failures. Similar to the lobotomy, there are some success stories where a patient's mental health was improved, albeit rarely. Let's recap the 1940s and 50s lobotomy. The truth is complicated, but generally speaking, lobotomists were often progressive reformers driven by the desire to improve the lives of their patients. Much like current doctors performing gender-affirming surgeries today, their intentions were good, but their methods were based on very weak research and lack of common sense that if you poke holes or bisect a patient's brain, it's not going to improve its performance. In the 1940s, there were no effective treatments for the severely mentally ill. Doctors had, ex had experimented with insulin shock therapy and electroconvulsive therapy with limited success, and asylums were filled with patients. The first luectomy took place in 1935 under the direction of the Portuguese neurologist Antonio Igas Maniz. Walter Friedman and James Watts then developed an American version and coined the term lobotomy. They then took a step further by developing the transorbital lobotomy. The original lobotomy method still required drilling holes in the skull, so surgery had to be performed in an operating room by trained neurosurgeons. Walter Freeman believed that this surgery would be unavailable to those he saw needed it most, patients in state mental hospitals that had no operating rooms, surgeons, or anesthesia in limited budgets. Freeman wanted to simplify the procedure so that it could be carried out by psychiatrists in psychiatric hospitals. Freeman conceived of approaching the frontal lobe through the eye socket instead of drilling holes in the skull. This was called the transorbital lobotomy. Now, as you can imagine, this procedure was controversial from its initial use. The use of the procedure increased dramatically in the early 1940s into the 50s. By 1951, almost 20,000 lobotomies had been performed been performed in the United States alone, and proportionally more in the United Kingdom. The purpose of the operation was to reduce the symptoms of mental disorders, and it was recognized that this was accomplished at the expense of the person's personality and intellect. British psychiatrist Maurice Partridge, who conducted a follow-up study of 300 patients, said that the treatment achieved its effects by reducing the complexity of psychic life. Following the operation, spontaneity, responsiveness, self-awareness, and self-control were reduced. People were largely left emotionally blunted and restricted in their intellectual range. In summary, the lobotomy was a procedure where a doctor, often not a surgeon, would take a medical utensil and impair or amputate a portion of someone's frontal lobe. The principle being that if you impair the brain, you impair the mental disorder. Comparing the lobotomy to gender-affirming surgeries has its challenges. Like, for example, the lobotomy was used as a general treatment for a variety of ailments, whereas gender-affirming surgery is used specifically for individuals with gender dysphoria. 
Another is that it's not easy to compare the success of a lobotomy to the success of gender-affirming surgery. A successful lobotomy was one that reduced the patient's psychological symptoms, which it appeared to do more often than it didn't. But it did it in such a way that you could also say that murdering the patient would also reduce their psychological symptoms. A successful gender affirmation surgery is a little more complicated. First, we don't have long-term studies on this, so we can't determine at what rate transgender people regret their transformation. We do know, however, that 80% of people who identify as transgender as teens don't identify as transgender as adults. That's scary, considering that this illustrates that teens are experimenting with the vogueness of the transgender movement, and the scary part is that they can make permanent changes to their bodies that would prevent them from changing their minds in the future as an adult. In spite of this, there are many ways that these two types of surgeries are comparable. First of all, these are somatic treatments that aim to address psychological conditions. Somatic treatments are things that have to do with the body, and specifically not the brain whereas psychological treatments are things to do with the brain and specifically not the body. However, in both the lobotomy and gender-affirming surgery, we are attempting to treat psychological conditions with physical somatic treatments. The death rate for someone with a lobotomy ranges from some European sources stating 8% up to American sources stating as high as 14 suggesting the American lobotomy method had double the mortality rate. But when it comes to gender-affirming surgery, 80 years have passed since the lobotomy was in vogue, and medical practices are infinitely better. Hardly anyone dies from surgery, let alone cosmetic surgery, like gender-affirming. But what we can look at are the suicide rates of these individuals. The most thorough follow-up of sex-reassigned people extends over 30 years and is conducted in Sweden, where the culture is strongly supportive of the transgendered. The study documents their lifelong mental unrest. 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those who had undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times that of their comparable peers. Because sex change is physically impossible, it frequently does not provide long-term wholeness and happiness that people seek. This is not to say that there aren't trans people who don't feel whole, you can see this in the comments of my videos, that there are people who are long-term beneficiaries from gender-affirming surgeries. But the research does show that the majority of surgeries don't accomplish what they seek. Here's how The Guardian summarized the results of a review of more than 100 follow-up studies of post-operative transsexuals by Birmingham University's Aggressive Research Intelligence Facility. The Aggressive Research Intelligence Facility, which conducts reviews of healthcare treatments for the National Health Service, concludes that none of the studies provides conclusive evidence that gender reassignment is beneficial for patients. It found that most research was poorly designed, which skewed the results in favor of physically changing sex. There was no evaluation of whether other treatments, such as long-term counseling, might help transsexuals, or whether their gender confusion might lessen over time. This sounds hauntingly similar to the lobotomy of the 40s and 50s. Walter Freeman, who initially claimed to have a success rate of 85%, was discovered to have a fatality rate of 15%. And when doctors investigated long-term outcomes for his patients, they found that just one-third could be regarded as experiencing some improvement, while another third were significantly worse off. Earlier, I mentioned that lobotomists were often progressive reformers, driven by the desire to improve the lives of their patients. However, in the specific case of Walter Freeman, there's overwhelming evidence that he is criminally negligent. In addition to fabricating the research that supported the benefits of the lobotomy, he also lobotomized children as young as four years old, and even recommended it for conditions such as postnatal depression. He was eventually banned from performing lobotomies, but never had his license revoked. We're currently at the point where, like the lobotomy, we're starting to learn more about gender-affirming surgery. For example, a Danish study that examined patients of gender-affirming surgery who had cases of somatic morbidity. The study measured the patients before and after gender surgery, concluding that the surgery made things worse. 
Overall, 19.2% of the sample were registered with somatic morbidity before gender-affirming surgery, and 23.1% after the, the surgery, suggesting that the surgery made it worse. Let's take a look at some of the trends in gender dysphoria treatment. According to Grandview Research, the current market size of transgender surgeries is a $1.9 billion industry in 2021 and will grow at a rate of 11.23% between now and 2030. If the 1940s lobotomy is any indication of the vogueness of popular but poorly researched medical practices, it took about 10 years for the scientific community and politicians to come to terms with the negative impacts of the lobotomy. I expect that between now and 2030, one of two things will happen. Either enough long-term data will be available to confirm that gender-affirming surgeries are a benefit, or we will wholly ban gender-affirming surgeries from minors at a minimum. This has already started to happen in some states. New tonight, the Medical University of South Carolina says they're dropping their pediatric transgender clinics. This means the hospital will no longer provide hormonal care or surgeries for transgender minors. The move comes after legislation passed in June addressing these services and the hospital's state funding. Anna Harris joins us in the control room to tell us how political organizations are responding. Anna. Cameron, I spoke with South Carolina Freedom Caucus, a conservative group of politicians from around the state, and they call this a win for childhood innocence. They say this should have been done in order to follow the legislature's most recent fiscal budget. Remember that we talked about Sweden, the country that was accepting of transgendered people. Well, Sweden's National Board of National Health and Welfare recently changed its treatment guidelines for children with gender dysphoria, admitting that care has been characterized by both deficiencies in accessibility and lack of knowledge about the results of the care. Back in May, the board officially ended the practice of prescribing puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for minors under age 18. But now the board is cutting back on providing mastectomies to minors as well. The American College of Pediatricians has said that there is no evidence that these types of treatments are safe for children, and that youth transition is totally experimental. It also stresses that there is currently no scientific support that gender corrective treatments reduces the risk of suicide in gender dysphoric children. On average, 80% of gender dysphoric children ultimately decide not to continue into adulthood as transgender. Think about that. <laughs> 